Good morning and welcome to worship at Christ Presbyterian Church. Let's first prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Again, good morning and welcome to worship at Christ Presbyterian Church. I am Kevin, the seminary intern, and I'll be with you this morning. I hope you have a warm drink prepared to accompany you this cold morning. It is Stewardship Sunday, so we'll be talking about that a little bit during the service. Um, if you haven't already signed up for the CPC this week, email Please do that and also keep an eye on that as we come into the season of Lent because there'll be a lot of things going on. You'll be receiving a special email about the Ash Wednesday service, which will be this coming Wednesday during the day from 3 to 6.30. You'll have an opportunity if you'd like to come to the church to walk through uh, kind of a, a devotional practice uh, that we have set up here. You'll be able to impose ashes on yourself as a part of that. If you'd rather come to the service in the evening at seven o'clock, you can do that as well. You can be here in person, you can attend on Facebook Live as well as you are now. And again, that will be another situation where you impose the ashes on yourself. So we certainly welcome uh, you to, Ash, to the church on Ash Wednesday this year. You can also pick up kits to take home to have ashes to impose on yourself. There are also some Lenten activities prepared. You can pick up those things. You can drop off your pledge card and so forth um, on Wednesday. We also have midday prayer today. If you'd like to come to church, you can just sign up online. Uh, please wear a mask. That takes place at 1130. So as always, you're welcome to join us for midday prayer today. 
If you know of anybody who doesn't isn't part of a, a faith community already, feel free to click the share button and share the service with them this morning. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Feel free to share peace in the comments, to text your friends, or rest in the knowledge that we are all grateful to be here together this morning. Now please join me in the call to worship. A love that never ceases. A creativity that designed the universe. A hope that cannot be quenched. A pursuit of reconciliation no matter the cost. These are the things that are of God. Then let us worship God. Our first hymn today is Crown Him with Many Crowns. join our voices together in a unison prayer of confession. Most holy, most forgiving, and most loving God, we admit to you and to each other that we are weak ones who foolishly and thoughtlessly choose darkness over the bright light of your grace. Together, we admit our weakness and submit it to you all our foolishness and thoughtlessness, our pride and vanity, our short-sightedness and lack of wisdom, our inability to change for the better, and our reluctance to ask for your guidance. Please forgive the pain and oppression we continue to visit upon others. Restore in us the bright light of hope and cleanse our hearts and minds. We beseech you, Lord, soften our hearts and strengthen our will to follow you. In the name of our Lord, Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Believe the good news of the gospel. Father, in whom is the fullness of light and wisdom, enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit, and give us grace to receive your word with reverence and humility, without which no person can understand your truth. For the sake of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory. Amen. You might already know that we often look at what's called the narrative lectionary when determining which scripture passages we'll cover in a given week. The narrative lectionary is a schedule of readings that helps us look at many parts of the Bible over a four-year period. When Ellen and I sat down to determine the Sundays on which I'd preach during my internship, however, the narrative lectionary was not the schedule I referenced. Instead, I looked at my calendar, and when I did, February 14th looked like a good Sunday on which to preach. It falls between the second and third academic terms at my seminary. It's the last Sunday before Lent begins, and Valentine's Day 2021 did not look like it was going to involve a, week a weekend getaway thanks to the pandemic, so I wouldn't get in trouble with my wife, Jennifer. Those of you who are familiar with lectionaries might also be familiar with commentaries. Commentaries are books that biblical scholars write about scripture. They're like the notes you find in study Bibles, but usually more detailed. As I was beginning my research for this week's passage on the Transfiguration, some things in the commentaries jumped out at me. New Interpreters refers to today's passage as one of the most elusive and evocative scenes in the Gospel. Fortress Commentary says it is awesomely inexplicable. I knew at that point I had my work cut out for me during my week of preparation. So I maybe should have looked at the lectionary in addition to my calendar, but gaining wisdom is part of what internships are about. All that said, my plan for today is to look deeper into these two challenging passages to offer what they might mean for us today, to speak to the topics of transfiguration and transformation, to make at least one 80s pop culture reference, and to somehow tie all of that into Stewardship Sunday. With that, let's turn to the Gospel. Today's scripture lesson is from Luke 9, 28 through 45. This is the message translation. About eight days after saying this, Jesus climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James along. While he was in prayer, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became blinding white. At once, two men were there talking with him, 
they turned out to be Moses and Elijah. And what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Peter and those with him were slumped over in speech, sleep. When they came to, rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. While he was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud enveloped them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud. This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. When the sound of the voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone. They were speechless, and they continued speechless, said not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. When they came down off the mountain the next day, a big crowd was there to meet them. A man called from out of the crowd, Please, please, teacher, take a look at my son. He's my only child. Often a spirit seizes him. Suddenly he's screaming, thrown into convulsions, convulsions his mouth foaming. And then it beats him black and blue before it leaves. I asked your disciples to deliver him, but they couldn't. Jesus said, what a generation. No sense of God. No focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into convulsions. Jesus stepped in, ordered the vile spirit gone, healed the boy, and handed him back to his father. They all shook their heads in wonder, astonished at God's greatness, God's majestic greatness. While they continued to stand around exclaiming over all the things he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, treasure and ponder each of these next words. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into human hands. They didn't get what he was saying. It was like he was speaking a foreign language, and they couldn't make heads or tails of it. But they were embarrassed to ask him what it meant. Holy wisdom, holy word. You're invited to pause for a moment for prayer and reflection on the text. For much of my life, when I read the Bible, I would do so sequentially, from Genesis to Revelation, a chapter a day. Later, I shifted to reading a chapter from the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible and a chapter from the New Testament. That would ensure more lapse through the shorter New Testament, which I figured was a good thing. When I made my way through the Bible a chapter at a time, I did so without devoting much thought to the context in which the book was written or the intent of the author or the fact that chapter and verse designations were added centuries later. I was really focused on taking in a given chapter, determining what lesson that isolated chapter had to teach, and figuring out how to apply that lesson to my life. With the help of various study Bibles, I picked up on a lot over the years. Then I got to seminary and began taking biblical studies classes. My professors have helped me notice things I'd never noticed before. We spend a lot of time talking about the authors of scripture, the contexts in which they wrote, and how everything fits together. We've learned that some things don't fit together as well as I'd previously thought. For instance, there are two different creation accounts at the beginning of Genesis. And then there's the Gospel of Luke, 
which fits together very well. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the Gospel of Luke begins with a smackdown of sorts. If I may offer an informal translation of the first few verses of Luke, to me it basically states, some folks have tried to put together an orderly account of the life of Jesus. Now I'm writing my orderly account, and I investigated everything carefully before doing so. A lot goes unsaid in that statement, and I suspect if Mark ever read it, his face turned red. Luke was right, though. His account is orderly, and it has a clear direction. Carefully and deliberately, Luke reveals to us who this Jesus was and is. The chapter and verse designations almost do his gospel a disservice, but unfortunately we don't have enough time to read the entirety of Luke from start to finish, let alone to continue with the sequel. What we see in today's passages is one of several incredible mountaintop experiences recorded in the Bible. Peter and James and John, the elite three among the chosen twelve, sleep through most of it. Then Peter offers to erect some tents, and then the three get scared. In the next passage, the disciples have failed to heal a demon-possessed boy. Jesus chews them out. Didn't I just give you the ability to cast out demons 40 verses ago? and then heals the boy. Following that, he explains how he is going to be betrayed, but the disciples don't understand. It's easy 2,000 years hence to give the apostles a hard time. They often don't get it right, but I myself would probably make the same mistakes they did along with some others. Were I to witness the transfiguration, all I could offer would be better tents than Peter's. You know, today's are compact, lightweight, quick drying, etc. Et What's not lost on me is that Jesus deliberately chose the 12 apostles as well as the women who followed him for most of his ministry. They were his disciples for a reason. That provides me some measure of relief because, like the apostles, I often don't get it right. I fall short of my potential or misunderstand a situation or revisit old, bad habits. We live in a complex time, and it seems every decision we make, big or small, involves consequences. Should I send my child to school during the pandemic or have her attend remotely? Should I buy the mixed nuts in the metal container or those in the single-use plastic container, which would save me a dollar? Is that coffee fair trade? Which corporations support the candidate for whom I plan to vote? Which electric choice providers really use sustainable energy sources? Should I respond to that Facebook post or let it go? Have you seen the NBC show, The Good Place? Its premise is that during one's life on Earth, you accumulate points, enough of which gain you entry to the good place, or heaven. While such a theology is not in keeping with our own, the church considered and decided against it in the fifth century, I appreciated the way the show approached the complexity of the moral decisions we make. For instance, eating vegan would earn you 425 points, but never discussing your veganism unless asked would earn you 9,875. My favorite illustration, though, is the following. In 1534, Douglas Weingar of Hawkehurst, England, gave his grandmother a dozen roses for her birthday. He picked them himself and walked them over to her. She was pleased. For this action, Douglas was awarded 145 points by Heaven and Hell's collaborative points system. 
In 2009, Doug Ewing of Skaggsville, Maryland, also gave his grandmother a dozen roses. He lost four points in the same system. Why? Because he ordered the roses from his cell phone that was made in a sweatshop. The flowers were grown with toxic pesticides and picked by exploited migrant workers and then delivered from thousands of miles away, creating a massive carbon footprint. The profits of said flower sale ended up in the pocket of a racist billionaire CEO who sends his female employees harassing pictures. These are indeed complex times, and thus we can all be forgiven for our occasional decision fatigue. I don't get the feeling Peter was as indecisive as I can be. At the transfiguration, he saw two luminaries of the Jewish faith standing alongside the man whom he recently realized was the Messiah of God. His reaction was to memorialize the occasion and, perhaps thinking of the tabernacle from the time of Moses, he offered to set up some tents. Luke suggests Peter didn't really know what he was saying. Again, this is understandable. The transfiguration probably occurred at night. He and John and James were tired. And all of a sudden, he was witnessing the appearance of Moses representing God's law and Elijah perhaps the greatest of the prophets. Some sort of recognition was in order. But then, in a manner reminiscent of God's appearance at Jesus' baptism, God speaks from the clouds, declaring that, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. Peter didn't misunderstand the situation by offering to build memorials in honor of Elijah and Moses. But if he thought they were there to lend credibility to the ministry of Jesus, the appearance of God likely caused him to push such thoughts aside. Both Moses and Elijah had been part of significant mountaintop experiences in the past. That's not what this was for Jesus, though. God in human form did not ascend a mountain to witness God's glory. Moses and Elijah appeared on a mountain to witness God's glory again, this time in the form of God's Son. Thinking back to Luke and the careful manner in which his gospel unfolds, we can see the role this story plays in revealing who Jesus is. It also plays a role in our liturgical year as we transition from learning who Jesus was to where he was going. Our other passage today speaks to that as well. Jesus casts out a demon and heals a boy, but he also asks how much longer he must remain with that faithless and perverse generation. And then he shares with his disciples that he would be betrayed into human hands. They didn't understand what he was saying at the time, but it's important to note that these stories appear in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Upon reflection, those who told the story of Jesus understood the significance of the transfiguration. We are living in a complex and challenging time, but things aren't all bad, and there is hope, perhaps even for us to get a few things right. The pandemic aside, we live in an abundant and amazing age. Some of us enjoy such comforts and conveniences as heated car seats, robot vacuums, and Netflix. Netflix is a wonder, especially to those of us who remember setting the VCR to record shows like The A-Team, which unfortunately, aside from Hannibal's tagline, has not held up well with time. You might argue that we have more than we truly need, I know this is tr the case for me. I did an inventory of my stuff as part of a men's retreat a few years ago, 
and was left a bit dazed by the experience. In my house, I found things like the following, a platform to hold my devices while they charge, many boxes of comic books, watches I haven't worn for years, a set of everyday china as well as a set of fine china, two santoku knives, and a banana hanger. What problem does that really solve anyway? The list goes on, but I think you see where I'm going. Many of us have so much stuff in our lives that it weighs us down. There are a number of reasons for this, but I think a primary one is that we're bombarded with messages that encourage us to consume, and our worth is often determined by our ability to consume. Sometimes we even shop for the sake of shopping, the end result of which is often more stuff cluttering our homes. It takes a deliberate effort on our parts to set aside our role as consumers and instead see and realize the potential God sees in us. The experience of doing that can be transforming. When Luke wrote his orderly account of the life of Jesus, he did not use the term transfiguration to describe today's mountaintop experience. Instead, he said Jesus was changed or transformed. That's a good reminder for a church that is always reforming, especially when we're in the midst of a global disruption. You've already been transformed. A year ago, you would not have anticipated the changes CPC's ministries would undertake in the coming months. Your worship service now extends across state lines, reaching people who had never before heard of Christ Presbyterian. You've supported the church financially, fueling local organizations that are keeping our neighbors afloat. And you've reached out to one another Zooming, Google Meeting, Facebook Living, FaceTiming, and mailing like never before. Being transformed also means that we're open to hearing new voices. If you're watching today but have never visited CPC, we'd like to hear from you. How can we be of more help to you or to our community? Different perspectives and experiences help us grow and we welcome anyone who would like to grow with us. Sure, we sometimes get it wrong, but that is the nature of the church. We wouldn't be here if we had everything figured out. We're all broken in one way or another, but collectively we still work to continue the mission of Jesus on earth. And although modern life is complicated, there are some things we can do that don't involve a partial point reduction. Comforting a friend in need. Sharing our worship service with someone who does not have a church home. Sending in your pledge card. Doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly. Thankfully, there are some things you can't get wrong. Stewardship Sunday, the new year, new leaders in our church, and the promise of post-pandemic life, they all offer us an opportunity to transform. I look forward to seeing what that means for Christ Presbyterian in the coming months. Like the disciples in today's readings, I might have fallen short. It's possible this elusive and inexplicable scripture got the best of me. But if I may, if this message offered something to you this morning, I have one final thing to say. I love it when a plan comes together. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer.
Lord, provider of all our gifts, thank you for your blessings on us as we humbly offer our pledges to you and your church on this Stewardship Sunday. We pray they will indeed further the work of Jesus and be a blessing to those we are called to serve. God of love, through Christ you said to us, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You seek us, you invite us to receive your friendship and abide in it. Teach us to respond more deeply to this invitation and grow in a life that is ever more complete. God of life, you call us to be praise in the midst of the world and to welcome one another as a gift of your grace. May your loving gaze, which rests upon each person, open us to receive each other just as we are. God of the one vineyard, you call us to abide in your love in all we do and say, touched by your goodness, grant us to be a reflection of that love in our homes and workplaces. May we pave the way for bridging rivalries and overcoming tensions. Holy Spirit, consoler of all, open our hearts to forgiveness and reconciliation and bring us back from our wanderings. Lord Jesus, gentle and humble of heart, give us poverty of spirit so that we may welcome the unexpectedness of your grace. God of life, you have created every human being in your image and likeness. We sing your praise for the gift of our many cultures, expressions of faith, traditions, and ethnicities. Grant us the courage always to stand against injustice and hatred based on class, race, gender, religion, and fear of those not like ourselves. Merciful God, you have shown us in Christ that we are one in you. Teach us to use this gift in the world so that believers of all faiths in every country may be able to listen to each other and live in peace. O oh, Jesus, you came into the world and shared fully in our humanity. You know the hardships of life for people who suffer in so many different ways. May the spirit of compassion move us to share our time, life, and goods with all those in need. Holy Spirit, you hear the fury of your wounded creation and the cries of those already suffering from climate change. Guide us toward new behaviors. May we learn to live in harmony as part of your creation. Holy Spirit, you create and recreate the church in all places. Come and whisper in our hearts the prayer which Jesus addressed to his Father on the eve of his passion, that they may all be one so that the world may believe. Lord, we also lift up the following to you this morning. Bill and Stan and Mike, Peter, Rini and Jamie, Al and Matthew, Elaine and Anne, Leanne and Maria, Sharon, Joanne and Tom, Helen, Donna's friends and family, Bill and George and Ginny, Donna and Joe and Herb. Now please join me in the prayer taught to us by Christ our Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is Jesus, Take Us to the Mountain.
may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.